listening to the Odessa Christian Faith Center podcast, where we dig deeper into God's Word and how it will transform our lives. Now here's your host, Mark Blair. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the OCFC podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm your host, Mark Blair, and today... On the show, we have a longtime member and relatively new staff member to Odessa Christian Faith Center, Kim Alvarado. Kim, thanks for being with us today. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for having me. Kim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How long have you been here? So I have been a member for about 11 years now, and I've been on staff for going on eight Eight. Um, eight months. Months. Yes. Not, not eight years, eight <laughs> <No>. months. <laughs> eight months. Don't let her try to fool you, people. <laughs> She's still a rookie. <laughs> okay. So a little bit about myself. Um, I oversee the nursery and the mm-hmm. preschool ministries here at Odessa Christian Faith Center. Brave. And I'm also a life group leader for our single moms and single women of the church. That's awesome. Cool. Yes. And for those of us who don't go to OCFC, what are... What's a life group? Um, a life group is basically, I see it as accountability. Okay. Um, you know, a group of people, you know, as far as us, it's, you know, single moms, single women. Mm-hmm. So just basically doing life together, having somebody that you know can hold you accountable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you need prayer during the week or any time, you know, you can call on can call on us and we're going to be there. Yeah. And so that's basically it. It's just an extension of the pastors for the mm-hmm. things that they can't do. Yeah. Being able to reach out and be there for people, a good support system. Yes. Well, that's really cool. So today, what we're going to talk about is one of your favorite series from our pastor, Pastor Don K. Wood. So which one is it? Which one's your favorite? Let's see. I would have to say um, the series, The Real You, mm-hmm. is one that has helped me a lot in my life um, here in the past year. Um, so at the time that Pastor was doing this series, I was beginning the transition coming from the health field. Um, I'd been in there for eight years. Mm-hmm. So I was not in a place. Months, no, not eight, eight actually months. But actually eight years this eight time. Eight years. Okay. Yes. So I'd been in that field for eight years. Um, so I was having to basically learn who I was apart from that role, um, you know, that I was coming from yeah. as I was entering into the ministry. Mm-hmm. So... You know, it was a huge transition that had to be made. Yeah. I kind of just found myself at a place where I was having to rediscover who I was. That's a really good point. Mm-hmm. And so it was perfect timing that the series came out at that time. Yeah. Now I want to go back to something that you said earlier. You said you had to rediscover who you were. Right. And I think that kind of ties into people over-identifying themselves with their jobs or with their careers? Would you say that that's something that you were having to work through? Oh, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, just having that time of eight years of doing a certain thing, you know, you you get good at it. Mm -hmm. You kind of get into a routine with it. It becomes not just something that you drive to during the day. It's something that you think about when you go home at night. It's something that you think about when you wake up in the morning. You got to think about what you're going to handle at work and all that kind of stuff. And you get, uh, you do get good at it. Right. You get used to the routine. You know how to, you know, the ropes, right. You know how to swing from one task to the next, you know, how to put out fires and handle business, so to speak. So whenever you're switching jobs, it's kind of like you're losing that part of your identity. Right. So what was that like? Because working in ministry is really, and you can say this about almost any job, but working in ministry is different than working anywhere else. Right. It's a different world that we live in. And so what were some of the things that you had to get used to? How, what did you have to rediscover about yourself? What do you mean when you say rediscover? Well, I knew that entering the ministry was a God thing. I knew that he had called me to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, I still had my mind telling me, oh, you're not qualified to do this. You know nothing about the ministry. You know nothing about the church. So, you know, who do you think you are, you know, coming in, yeah, coming to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was a big battle, just trying to discover you know, and figure out my part here at the church. Yeah. And so that for me was, 
a big challenge. Mm-hmm. Because whenever you're first coming into any organization, but even especially a church, right. and you're you can kind of feel like an outsider because right. your role isn't established. Right. And so instead of feeling like part of the body, you can kind of feel like a watch on the body. Right. Like you could be taken off at any moment oh, or yeah. something like that. Is that kind of what you were experiencing? Yes. How long would you say that it took you to kind of assimilate yourself? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe about three months or so mm-hmm. until I kind of felt like, okay, I know what my role is. I know what my responsibilities are. Yeah. And just taking it from there and just um, allowing the Holy Spirit to show you new ideas. That's good. And just good. letting him show you what you're, what you're supposed to be doing here. You yeah. Know? So it's just a whole lot of relying on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, but let's go back to what you said um, earlier in that you felt like you were unqualified. Uh, for the position. Like you didn't, you had all those thoughts running through your head that you didn't know anything about being in ministry. You didn't know how to do anything. How did you deal with that? Because I think we all deal with that. Like I've been in ministry uh, for six years now, full-time ministry for six years, and I still deal with that. Right. And I think that everybody in any job or anything at all, it could be your marriage, it could be parenting, it could be whatever you're part of, the devil's going to come at you and he's going to tell you that, hey, you're not good enough right. to do this. You don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. What, who, and then you said it. Who do you think you are? Mm-hmm. So how'd you deal with that? Like I said, um, you know, just a whole lot of time in prayer, mm-hmm. a whole lot of going to the Holy Spirit and just letting him remind you who you are. Mm-hmm. Because on my own, those thoughts are going to keep coming. And if I don't rely on the Holy Spirit, then, you know, I was going to defeat myself before even allowing myself to grow in the ministry. That's good. So that's really good. I think that's such a great point for anybody, not just the ministry, but like I said earlier, any new endeavor that you try to take on, you can defeat yourself Mm -hmm. Before anybody else comes along and tries to defeat you, oh, yeah. just in your mind, oh, yeah. you lose. Like it's like Joyce Meyer talks. It's the battlefield of the mind. Oh, yeah. And if you lose the battle in your head, you're gonna you're gonna lose the battle in the in the real world. So that's really good. So let's go. Let's talk a little bit more about this series. How did the teachings in this series? How did they help you grow? What did they help you do? Because you were doing work on your own. Right. You know, you were praying, you were talking to the Holy Spirit, and you said it earlier, you know, you let him, you allowed him to remind you who you were. How did he use these teachings to do that? So basically, it was just a reminder um, as far as, you know, who God created us to be. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as it says in Psalms 139, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Just that reminder to myself that, Every part of me, my personality, my character, no matter what part of me, God knows, he knows it all. Yeah. He called me to this. So if I have him believing in me, then it's already taken care of. Absolutely. What I think, it doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. So that's good. So yeah, just, you know, by going to him, he was able to show me who I was apart from whatever titles I had. That's really good. I like that you mentioned that God knows every part of us. And it's not just that he knows it, he made it. Right. Because I used to deal in myself with uh, thinking negatively about myself and some of my own character traits, like naturally and also the way that I was raised and the family that I was raised in, I'm very sarcastic. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> in high school, I w- to the point of being biting and rude. And in high school and college, I was good at, even though it's a bad thing, I was good at (laughs) cutting people down very quickly. Mm -hmm. And my quick wit would get me in a lot of trouble because there wasn't a very thick filter between my quick wit and my mouth. Mm -hmm. Because I would think things and then I would just let them flow right out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed... What I notice now that I teach on a consistent basis. Now, this is just my example, and I'm sure you have examples too of this. Of God will use your personality traits, the things that you thought were bad about you, right. 
God will turn and use them for good. And now that I teach on a consistent basis, what I've noticed is that God uses my quick wit in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. God uses my quick wit and my quick mouth in the pulpit. And that if my thoughts are lined up with the word of God and my heart is lined up with the word of God, then the word that I put in is will quickly come out and he uses it to preach through me because I'll get done with teachings sometimes and not remember what I said right. <laughs> or I didn't plan to say anything that I did say, but it turned out really well because I've yielded myself to the Holy Spirit and God uses those parts of my personality that I thought weren't good, right. that I thought I just needed to completely cut off. And God said, no, let's repurpose that mm -hmm. and let's use that in your ministry. Have you noticed that since you've gotten here? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Some things that you thought maybe, oh, well, I should probably just stop doing that. God says, no, let's just reshape it. Right. Let's just reform it. Yes. That's really good. What's one of the verses that Pastor Don used in the series that really stuck out to you? What's something that really jumped out at you that hadn't before? Um, let's see. I would probably say in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, where mm -hmm. it says... Um, that we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. um, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Yeah. Basically, just like every single thought that comes up in your mind that is contrary to the word of God, basically just throwing it to the ground, destroying it before it even has a chance to even touch your mind. That's good. You know, That's so, really good. How do you do that? How do you do that in your own life? Reading the Bible, renewing mm -hmm. your mind just constantly constantly renewing your mind mm -hmm. when we read the bible that's where we're gonna we're gonna find out what he says yeah and without that knowledge that's we're good. gonna fall for whatever lies the enemy tries to throw at us or in our own minds mm -hmm. you know see and i love that that's the verse that you went with and that's always a set of verses that jumps out to me because in that chapter you know paul says in the previous verses, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They don't right. exist in this world, in this physical world. But they're spiritual and mighty mm -hmm. for the pulling down of strongholds. But if you aren't in the word, then you're really running into battle disarmed, right? empty-handed. And whether we realize it or not, we're in a battle. Oh, yeah. And like you said, you have to throw things down to the ground and destroy them before they even touch your mind, before you give the devil a foothold. Right. And, you know, it says for the pulling down of strongholds. And really, people have gone way off the rails with what a stronghold is. But these strongholds are mindsets. Oh, yeah. That's how the Bible defines them. A stronghold, oh, yeah. is a, it's a mindset. It's what you have set your mind on. Right. And that is what you have to tear down. It's the things that they exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Right. Against who we really are. Right. And those are the things that we have to tear down. And I think that maybe you could be born with them. But I think that also, like life as we live it, we build them up. Oh, yeah. They're built without us realizing it. I think that childhood, we build up strongholds in childhood. And we don't fully realize everything that they are until we get older. Right. And so you have to do exactly what you said. You have to renew your mind to the word of God because coming into this thing, coming into Christianity, a relationship with Jesus, you walk in with baggage. Oh, yeah. And really what that baggage is, is the strongholds. Oh yeah. So how did this series help you understand God's will for your life? Well, it helped me to understand um, that God has this huge plan and huge purpose for us. Mm-hmm. And it just helped me to remember that the plan, you know, that he began even before I was even born. Mm -hmm. As it says, you know, he will be faithful to complete it. Yeah. And as it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, he has plans for us. He, the thoughts that he thinks towards us are thoughts of peace and not of evil mm -hmm. to give us an expected end. So it just, it was just a reminder that okay, he didn't bring me here and he's just going to leave me here. Like, okay, now you have to figure all this stuff on your own. Mm -hmm. It's just a reassurance that he's going to see me through till the end. Yeah. And so that is just comforting knowing that the God that created me, he not only has a plan and a purpose for me, but he's going to help me along the way to get to where 
he wants me to be. Yeah. That just helped a whole lot. Yeah. That's really good because I think, and I've been guilty of this, is that we trust God and we really believe God and we're really leaning on him to get us to a place, get us to a job, get us to a relationship, get us to a certain school or city or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then once we get there, we're like, okay, thanks. Oh, yeah. Thanks for getting me here, but I've got it. Right. I can handle it. Don't worry about me now. And we think that we just needed God to get us to the place. Oh, no. But <laughs> you need God to sustain you, too. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Because the the day in, day out of it, you have to trust God for that, too. And if you think that you can rely on your own strength... And you're gonna run. You're gonna burn out quick. Right. That's something that I've noticed in my life, uh, for sure. Is that on the days whenever we're like, okay, I've got it. And I'm never, I'm never gonna mm-hmm. outright say that to God. And I don't mm-hmm. think anybody mm-hmm. is. I don't think you would, no. right? Like, okay, God, I've got this. We don't do that. But it's not like an active acknowledging. Like, okay, God, you can just rest today. Just you know, right. just chill. Right. I've got it. <laughs> Right. But we more do it through um, almost ignoring him oh, yeah. or failing to acknowledge him. You know, waking up in the morning being like, okay, it's another day, Father. And just like every other day before it, like you've got to carry me through. Right. You've got to carry me. You've got to show me what to do. You've got to give me the strength to do it. Because if not, I'm going to get to the end of this day and... You know, there's a 50-50 chance that I'll still be a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's right. a 50-50 chance that I'll get all of my work done and that I'll still love you at oh, the yeah. end of this day. Oh, yeah. Have you experienced days like that since you've gotten here? Be honest. Oh, yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's gotten, I don't know if I would say it's gotten easier, mm-hmm. but um, just that reliance and just that trust has been built between between me and God, knowing, man, I can't do any of this on my own. Mm-hmm. And so it's just nice to have been able, this whole process of walking this out and yeah. just figuring it out. And that's basically what I'm doing is just a day-by-day trusting and allowing him to lead me because I can't do it on my own. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, not at all. Not I like that you said that maybe it hasn't gotten easier, but you've gotten better at it. Right. And I think that God strengthens us through the process. Oh, yeah. You know, that he's he's going to carry us through, but he's going to strengthen us in the process. And really, I think it goes back to what you were saying, that you've built that trust, that reliance on God. And it's not necessarily that we get stronger. It's that we learn to rely on God's strength. Mm-hmm. more and more and that's what we we learn our true source of strength right in the middle of the process right. we learn where our power really comes from where all of our ability comes from right anyway and the mistake uh the mistake that i make and i've seen other people make is that um you start relying too much on you, your own talent you think you you have to you know that it is your strength mm-hmm that you're the one getting stronger. No, God is just showing himself through you. Right. That's really good. I like that. So earlier you talked about renewing your mind. Um, For those of you who don't know, that uh, comes from Romans 12 too. It says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That comes through reading your Bible. That comes through having a healthy, uh, overflowing prayer life. So what does that look like for you? Like when you sit down to read your Bible, what do you do? What do you read? Um, Typically my day will just begin, um, you know, just in bed, just reading the Bible and I'll read a few chapters. Is that on your phone? Um, Yes. It's Mm -hmm. typically on my phone. Are you one of those people who holds the phone above your face? No. And scrolls like that? No, so no. you never drop the phone on your face? Okay. I mean, just... I've done that before, but... <laughs> but not while reading your <laughs> Bible. Not... Yeah, I don't think... <laughs> um... Everybody out there has done that at some uh... point. You're lying down, scrolling through your phone <laughs> on what? <laughs> Facebook, Pinterest, uh... hopefully the Bible. It's like, oh, I got so tired reading the word. You're probably uh... reading Leviticus. Uh... And then you drop the phone on your face. But I, I'm sorry. I... Uh... 
I digress. <laughs> so you start off, you, and you don't even you don't even get up. You, so you keep you just before you your feet even hit the floor, you're reading the word. Right. Just yeah, just sitting there in bed, and just I'll read a few chapters. What's the first book you normally go to in the Bible? I normally go to Proverbs. Do you do like the daily thing where yes. you read the proverb a day? Proverb a day, and just usually just starting there and just meditating on that, and sometimes I'll read a little bit deeper into other other chapters and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I do that in the morning and then, Mm -hmm. you know, throughout my morning while I'm getting ready, I'll be watching a sermon Mm -hmm. to be renewing my mind while I'm getting ready. Yeah. And I mean, it not only helps with me, but my daughter's running in the room and it's helping her. Mm -hmm. And so she's listening to it also. Yeah. So I know it's benefiting both of us. Yeah. A lot better than just throwing cartoons on or something in order to, you know, make some noise and fill the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. So we do that. And then, Mm -hmm. um, You know, it helps that now she knows how to read. So on Uh our way to school, um, we have that Jesus Calling devotional. Mm -hmm. So I have her read one of those. Which Um, one is it? Do you have like the adult version or did you get her the kids version? it's the kids version. Yeah. Everybody out there, I just want to throw this out there. Don't discount a children's Bible. Oh, yeah. Don't (laughs) discount a children's devotional. Like you'd be like, oh, I'm, you know, 37 and I've been a Christian, you know, (laughs) since I was eight years old. No, there's some kids Bibles out there and there's some kids devotional out there that really are powerful stuff. They've got a lot of good things in them. So anyway, you have her read out of the Jesus Calling? Yeah, I'll have her read out of that. And then more often than not, you know, it's something that I'm dealing with or, Mm -hmm. you know, she may be dealing with. So um, I just see it as we're both benefiting from this and, you know, just using that time, just ensuring that we get our day started off. Yeah, absolutely. There's... A lot of power in that. Oh, yeah. Like, I get up in the mornings, and I get up early, and I go to the gym. And usually what I do, I have my phone with me, and so I'll throw my headphones in. And there was a long time where I was going to the gym where I was just listening to music. And I would just listen to music, and, you know, like, you go to the gym, and you want to listen to something with, like, a driving (laughs) electric guitar and drums or something (laughs) with a beat or whatever. And the Holy Spirit was like, hey, you're in the gym for an for an hour and a half there, son. Right. You could listen to two teachings before you even start your day. Oh, yeah. And I said, okay. And so I started doing that instead of just, like, listening to, like, angry guy music, <laughs> you know, like, oh, got to crank it out. It's <laughs> listening to the Word right. and listening to Pastor Don. Like, with The Real You is one of the series that I go back to. I keep it on my phone so I can listen to it over and over again. There's other teachers, Pastor Charles Neiman and other guys that I go to a lot. Uh, and that's how I start my day. And then I've started waking up even earlier. And I do the same thing that you do. And I'll wake up and I'll read a chapter of Proverbs. And I like to read the Psalms too because something that I've noticed about me is that uh, I like the Proverbs because it's the book of wisdom. Right. And I like to, there's some other chapters. I have some, I have four chapters that I read every day from different books in the Bible. But the Holy Spirit was like, you need to read the Psalms in the morning too because you need to, and this is, this is how you renew your mind. This is one of the ways you renew your mind and you let the Holy Spirit speak to you through your Bible reading. Right. Um, Holy Spirit told me, he said, you need to develop the heart of a worshiper more because mm. you're a, thinker. You like to think about a lot of things Mm -hmm. and you need to learn to let go and worship God for who he is. Not all the cool little, you know, details in the Bible or whatever, but actually just worship God the way David did, the way the other writers in the Psalms did. And that's something that's really helped me out a lot. And you said also throughout the day that you read some things throughout the day. So what else? What else do you um, read in your Bible? Well, during the day, I'm normally just, if I have my earphones on, you mm-hmm. know, just listening to different sermons and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, even just music, you know. Yeah. I mean. Sometimes that really does it for you when it comes to spending time with God. Because yeah. some days, I mean, let's be honest, like you just don't have it for a teaching. Right. You don't have the attention span for a teaching. And you could have a lot being thrown at your mind. Right that day and being able to praise God and worship God through an attack is 
that's a big deal. Oh yeah. Pe- people and I, I can. I'm speaking from experience. Is people discount it? Mm-hmm. I think they're like, oh, you know, it's just Christian music. You know, it's just worship music. You're just, you know, just filling the noise. You know, putting noise in your ears so you don't have to think about it. No, that's not true. No. So what I want to do now is let's take it all the way back, full circle, to something you said at the beginning. Okay. Because you've been in ministry for eight months now, and before that, you know, you were in the medical field for eight years. And, you know, what the series, The Real You, talks about is obviously who you really are. Right. And when God created us, he did not make us a job. Right. He didn't create us robots like, okay, like this is Kim Alvarado and she's going to work in ministry. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, he definitely plans that out, but who you really are and the way that God really sees you is not your minute, is not your job. Right. It's not your, it's not the salary you earn at that job. Mm -hmm. It's not even what you do at that job. So when you said you had to rediscover who you really were, it didn't have anything to do with your occupation. Right. What did it have to do with? What did that... When you said you had to rediscover who you really were, who are you? Who are we? Like, who are we really? Like, how does God see us? God doesn't see us for an occupation. Right. How does God see us? How does he look at us? Who are we to him? I mean, who we are to him is, you know, we're here on this earth and we are supposed to look like him. We're supposed to act like him. We're supposed to be him Mm -hmm. to that person that's walking down the street and has never heard anything about him. Yeah. So that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be imitators of him. And so I think just having to learn every attribute of him, like who he really is. He is going back to the fruit of the spirit, having to learn to be patient, having mm-hmm. to learn to be loving, mm-hmm. having that's who we really are. Yeah. You know, when we are born again, our spirit is changed mm-hmm. and we are just like him. Mm-hmm. So having that in us, that is the real us. That's the real me Yeah, is I should be aiming to look like him. Yeah. And so just having to rediscover all that mm-hmm. and just like letting the real you out. Right. Because it is, it's there in your spirit. And then you are, like we talked about earlier, Romans 12 too, you're transformed right. by the renewing of your mind. Well, your spirit doesn't need to be transformed. Right. It's your soul, mm-hmm. you know, and then your flesh kind of follows along because it's, you know, the lesser of the three and right. will go with the majority. Right. So when you get your soul to line up with what's in your spirit, then you start acting like the real you. Right. You start letting the fruit of the spirit grow Mm -hmm. in your life. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier is that it's not your power. No. It's not your uh, strength that's going to bring about the fruit of the spirit, fruit of the spirit in your life. Right. Because it's not the fruit of Kim Alvarado. (laughs) It's not the fruit of Mark Blair. It's the fruit of the spirit. Right. And so the same way that you read, you know, God who began a good work in you is faithful and just to complete it, it, the spirit who began a good work in you Mm -hmm. will is faithful and just to bear that fruit in your life when you allow him to do it. Whenever you're not sitting there straining to be loving, straining to be (laughs) joyful. That's a big one. Yeah. I think anybody who's got an eight to five job, like joy, Joy is a big deal. <laughs> Joy is a big deal because there, yeah. it's easy. Like for me, mm-hmm. when the devil's going to attack me, and whenever I'm going to run into trouble, uh, allowing the spirit to move in my life is on the drive to work. Mm-hmm. That is when the devil's going to throw <laughs> stuff at my mind. Right. He's like, "Oh, I got to go to work." Yeah. What do you, you know, think about this? Oh, you got to do all this, and then you got to do this tomorrow. And then when are you going to have time to do the work that you really want to do after you're done with all the busy work and all the stuff that you have to do? Right. And then think about this. And doesn't that make you angry? And doesn't that make you frustrated? And doesn't that make you kind of depressed about all the things that you And he's going to throw all that stuff at my mind in the span of a 12 minute drive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I have to allow the spirit to move 
and, and do exactly what you say is cast those thoughts down. Right. And I do it uh, verbally. Right. I actively do it. If I have a thought come up in my head, I say no. Right. No, I'm not taking that one. Mm-hmm. And you got to be, like you said, you got to be quick. Oh, yeah. You got to be quick because if you let it just plant just a little bit, just a little bit mm-hmm. plant up in your head, it, it can mess you up all day. Oh, yeah. It can mess you up. And then the other time, if I'm just, can I, if I can be honest, is around lunchtime when I start to get hungry, <laughs> I get hangry. <laughs> I'm a hangry, I'm a hangry yeah. person. Like if you keep me away from food for too long, then... We're, I'm also going to have trouble allowing the spirit to move in my life. <laughs> Do you ever get that one where you just, you're like, oh, I'm so angry, and, you know, this and this and this. And God's like, ah, like you're adorable. Like you're just, you're hungry. You need yeah. a sandwich. <laughs> I get that a lot. So I think what we really need to focus on is exactly the things that you've been talking about. And what it talks about in the series is who we really are. That when we go to whatever our occupation is, stay-at-home mom, teacher, oil field worker, nurse, whatever it is that we go to, that we need to realize that that's not our real identity. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's what we do, but that's not who we really are. And I think that we can bring a lot more of the love of God and the presence of God to what we do when we're more aware of who we are, oh, yeah. the real us, that we are sons and daughters of God, right. that we are saved by grace, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that no matter how the day goes, no matter how the week, the month, or the year goes, God still loves us. Oh, yeah. God is still on our side, and he still sees us exactly the same way that he saw us in the morning before all the other things happened. Right. And so tapping into who we really are is going to allow us to bring the presence of God to our jobs, bring the presence of God, the love of God to whatever it is we're doing. Right? Yes. Well, Kim, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for sharing. Thank Uh, you for having me. Thank you for (laughs) answering questions about your personal life, things that maybe you weren't necessarily prepared to answer, but I'm sure everybody out there appreciates it (laughs) because you don't know how your testimony is going to help somebody out. Right. Give somebody else an idea that maybe changes their life. It could just be a little thing. Right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to let you listen to a clip of one of Pastor Don's teachings from his series, The Real You, the series that Kim and I have been speaking about. The title of the teaching is Walking by the Spirit, Part 1. Now, our text scriptures have been found in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now, may the God of peace, so he's a God of peace, himself sanctify or set you apart completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, here we see that we are a Three-part being spirit, soul, which is the mind, emotions, and the will, and we live in the body. And we know the Bible teaches us in Genesis 1.26 that when God created mankind, he was created in God's image, his likeness, an exact duplication in kind because Jesus said to us in the book of John that God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Adam sinned, and when he sinned, he died or was separated spiritually from God. And death entered into the world. We now live in a fallen world. We live in a world today that God never intended for us to live in. It's a world of corruption It's a world of decadence. It's a world of sin and death and pain and hurt and sickness. And the list goes on and on and on. And yet God had a plan. And in that plan, he sent his only begotten son to this earth. He lived a sinless life with the ultimate purpose of going to a cross and paying for the wages of all of mankind's sins, beginning with the sin of Adam. And Jesus said to us in John 3, 3, 
when we are born from on high, born again, born from on high, then we come into a relationship with God. We become one with God because 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. And so one of our other text scriptures has been found through the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He or she is a new creation, literally a new species of being that never existed before. Old things, primarily the old sin nature we're born with because of Adam's sin. Paul told us through the book of Romans that because of one man's sin, we're all born into sin. And so the old things Primarily, and it's other things as well, but the primary thing that passes away is that old nature of sin, that old spirit that we were born with that is separated, apart, dead to God, and now comes alive unto God. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so you are now a new creation in Christ. And the Bible tells us another text verse we've used from 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, and the last part of the verse, because as he, that's Jesus, everybody say he, is Jesus. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So I've shared with you, when we are born again, when we are born from on high, your spirit, which is created in Christ, is perfect, complete, whole, will never change, needs no need to be edified, has no need to grow, has no need to be taught. Your spirit is perfect, mature in Christ. And we still have the propensity and potential as Christians to sin. Through our flesh. I'll deal with that in just a moment. But your spirit, your born again in Christ spirit, never again will need to be cleansed from any defilement. Because I've shared with you from Ephesians that our born again spirit is now sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. And from the moment we are born again and there is a subsequent experience to the new birth that we can be baptized with the Holy Spirit, that God will give us a heavenly prayer language, that once that takes place, the Christian life now is learning how to walk in the Spirit. That's what the Christian life becomes. The moment you receive Jesus as Savior, it's now learning how to walk in the Spirit. And then I shared with you from Ephesians 1, 3, that God, upon our salvation experience, deposits in our born-again spirit all of the spiritual blessings of God himself. All the attributes, all the characteristics, all of God are now within your born-again spirit. The Bible says so. 1 John chapter 4, 17. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Colossians 2, 10. We are now complete in him. Again, Ephesians 1, 3. We have been given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so... God is wanting to teach us in this great church to begin to allow Christ to dominate our lives, to no longer be dominated by the five physical senses, to be dominated any longer by the corruption of the world, the flesh, and the enemy himself. Now, we have learned that you cannot feel nor can you see your spirit. You can't feel him. But nonetheless, that is the real you. That's who you really are. Thank God for your ethnicity, but that is not your true identity. Your identity is not based upon your pedigree, who you're born to. 
Your identity is not based upon the kind of money you have, the kind of friends you have, the kind of cars you drive, clothes you wear, jewelry you have, houses you live in. All those things are fine. They're good. But that is not your true identity. Your true identity is who you are in Christ. That is the real you. And we are to be dominated by the real us. All these characteristics of God, all these attributes of God, all of these spiritual blessings of God within us, you perceive by faith. Based upon what God's Word says, you already have. They are discerned. They are understood. Perceived by faith through the Word of God. Jesus said to us in John 6, 63, that my words are spirit and they are life. So God's words are spiritual food. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what God wants us to do, church, is to shift our living by what we can see with our natural eyes to what we begin to see in the Word of God. In the book of James and the book of 2 Corinthians 3, we are told that the Bible is like a mirror, that when you put the Word of God into your mind, it's like a mirror. You begin to see yourself as who you are in Christ. You begin to see God in his love for you. You begin to see God in his patience, in his joy, all his characteristics and all his attributes. When you begin to see God in the word of God, it's like a mirror to your soul. And he begins to change you. It begins to change your thoughts. It begins to change how you speak. It begins to change your behavior on the Word of God rather than the natural realm that we live in, which is corrupt and perverse. The world around you is corrupt, I'm telling you again. You cannot live by what you see with your natural eye. You cannot. Galatians 5, 16. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul writes and says, I say then... Walk in the Spirit. Now, Romans 8, which we're going to look at today, Romans 8, the Apostle Paul said that when you are born again, you are now in the Spirit. Whether or not you walk in the Spirit ever again, you're in the Spirit the moment you're born again. So now Paul says, not only does God want you to be born again or in the Spirit, but now he wants you to walk again. In the Spirit. And we know in this church the word walk means the way we live our lives, our manner of living. So he says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. So he's saying to us very vividly that you still have the flesh to contend with as a Christian. He's saying to you in that verse, as a Christian, you can still choose to think. Wrong thoughts, say wrong words, and live your life in a manner that's unrighteous and unholy. He says, but if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of your flesh. And again, the word flesh here is an umbrella term for that part of our lives that is selfish, independent of God, greedy, religious, prideful, arrogant, self-serving, self-centered. You'll always have that to contend with, but that's not the real you. You're no longer your flesh. You are now the spirit man in Christ that you have become once you ask Jesus into your life. He says in verse 17, for the flesh, this part of our lives that's selfish and anti-Christ, lust or has desires against the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has desires for us that are opposite the lust and desires of the selfish flesh. And these are contrary. Say contrary. These are contrary to one another. So that you do not. Talking to born again spirit filled Christians. So that you do not. 
do the things that you wish. So he says here, if we're allowing the desires of the flesh to control us, then God is saying that part of our lives that is born again and that is in Christ, it has new desires, but those desires will not be fulfilled because we're choosing to still walk in selfishness, greed, self-centeredness. He says, though, in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit Remember, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. But if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, he just said to us here that there is a conflict in all of our lives. This is the Christian conflict that every Christian deals with the moment you say yes to Jesus. And there's a conflict here between what is in your flesh and what is in our born-again spirit. The word contrary here means that they are opposed to one another. They are enemies one to another. They are adversaries one to another. Now, the flesh, that part of our lives, that self-centered, selfish, independent of God, prideful and arrogant, this part of our lives always gravitates towards the five physical senses. What we hear, see, smell, taste, and feel, okay? It always gravitates towards the five senses. I taught you several weeks ago, and I think I've already alluded to it today, that in Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, when we come into the world, Romans says, I said earlier, that because of one man's sin, we're all born into sin, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and 2, tells us that by nature we are children of the devil because of one man's sin. So our spirit is not controlled by God. Our spirit is dead or separated from God. So we are by nature, Paul says, children of the devil. So when we're born again, we have this new nature. And your spirit, we know, no longer compels us to sin. Before Christ, you had no choice. Your spirit, my spirit, compelled us to live in sinfulness, to have dirty thoughts, to say wrong words, to behave unethically, immorally, to be selfish, to live with unforgiveness and jealousy and bitterness, all these attributes that are ungodly and unholy. We had no choice. So, when you're born again, you have this new nature, and this new nature will never compel you to do anything of the such. But your flesh gravitates towards the five senses. Therefore, your flesh still has the ability to gravitate towards Satan because he controls the physical world. 1 John 5, 19, the whole world system is under the control of the enemy, Satan. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he blinds the minds of those that don't believe. Well, he's talking about unbelievers, but he can also be talking there about believers who remain ignorant of God's will for their everyday lives. So when our flesh is gravitating towards the five senses. It's gravitating towards the spirit or the kingdom of darkness. Why? Because our flesh operates in the natural realm. Our flesh operates in the physical realm. Satan, listen to me, Satan can, he is a spirit, but he's a dead spirit, which means he's eternally separated from God. So he's a dead spirit, but he cannot operate spiritually like God does, like the angels of God, like we can. He cannot do that. He only operates through carnal, natural, physical things. That's how he operates. He cannot operate through your spirit if you're born again. God, on the other hand, God leads by his word. I shared a week or so ago, Satan is a driver. He puts pressure on your flesh. He puts pressure on your flesh to compete with your spouse. He puts 
pressure on your flesh to try to outdo other people and to look good to the boss based upon your own self-serving attitudes. That's the flesh. Satan put, because the flesh is always fearful. The flesh is fearful that someone is going to get something that you in your flesh think that you deserve. Talk to me today. That's the flesh. And so Satan puts pressure, puts stress on the flesh to act out. He drives like cattle. But I shared with you a week or so ago, God doesn't drive, he leads. He calls us sheep. It's just a metaphor. Sheep are led. Cattle are driven. And God leads. Listen to me. God leads, not with the flesh, not with the five senses. God leads by his word. That's how God leads. He leads, leads by his spirit in conjunction with his word. 1 John 5, 7 says, These three bear record or agree in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Okay? One of these two will dominate your life or a combination thereof. I'll give you a combination. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And they said, well, one say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're one of the prophets. Jesus said, wonderful. That's what they're saying out here on the street. Who do you say I am? Simon Barjona spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus shot back and he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus began to share with them that he would have to go to Jerusalem and die for all the people. And Peter rebuked him. And Jesus turned to him and he said, Satan, I rebuke you. So in one moment, you have Peter being led by the Spirit, being led by the Word of God. And in the very next moment, he's led by Satan. So we're either being dominated by one of these two areas or there is a combination thereof. In Romans 8 and verse 8, Paul writes and says, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hebrews eleven six, 6. Only by faith can we please God. Faith in what? In what God has said. Trusting God's word. When we're in the flesh, when we're being dominated by the flesh, the antithesis of God's kingdom. You can't please God. Verse 12. He said, therefore, brethren, the church, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. In other words, God is saying, you don't have to live by the flesh if you don't want to. It's a choice now. We're debtors not to live after the flesh any longer. He says, if you live according to the flesh, verse 13, you will die. But if by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, death can mean physical death. Death can mean spiritual death. It can. Spiritual death is just separation from God. That's what happened to Adam when he sinned in the garden. He died spiritually. He was separated from God. So the word death can mean spiritual death. It can mean physical death, sarx, S-A-R-X. That's the Greek word. But it's also an umbrella term for the flesh. It's an umbrella term for all sin. Why? Because the Bible says sin kills. Sin destroys. So death can be the result of any sin in people's lives. And so, among other things, Paul is teaching us that if we live after the flesh, we end up as Christians staying worried, fearful, depressed, even suicidal, sick, dying young, jealous, envious, living our lives in an uncontrolled manner. Satan family enters the flesh. Satan enters our lives through the flesh. 
He can't touch your spirit. He can't touch your spirit if you're born again. He operates through the flesh. And the flesh operates through the five senses. Verse 1 of chapter 6 of Romans. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I shared with you a few weeks ago that if a preacher is really doing what God's called him to do, especially when he's ministering on grace, every person in the congregation ought to have at least this thought. Does this mean I can live in sin with no problem? If I'm under the grace of God, shall I just continue to live by my flesh? Paul answers the question. It's a question that ought to be asked. It's not wrong for you to be thinking that. If you're truly hearing the grace of God and not the Mosaic law. Look what he says. God forbid. God forbid. New King James says, certainly not. Now look, he answers the question. Listen to what he says. How shall we that are dead or separated from sin live any longer therein? What's he talking about? That we're dead to sin. Paul is not saying that Christians can't sin. He's saying here, listen to me carefully. This is where people become confused. He's saying here, your spirit is dead to sin. The real you is now dead to sin. The real you is now one spirit with the Lord. The real you is now full of all the spiritual characteristics and attributes, attributes of God himself. Your spirit man cannot sin. Why? Because he's sealed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 3. He says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Let me stop. The Bible teaches, again, this same writer, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes in the first four or five verses and says there's only one baptism. But then there's other places in the New Testament that talks about three baptisms. And so people read these things and they say, aha, God contradicts himself. No, he doesn't. Because the Bible very clearly states there are three baptisms. Number one, there is the baptism into Jesus Christ's death. That happens when you're born again. Number two is the baptism with water. And number three is the baptism with the Holy Spirit that gives you a heavenly prayer language to pray perfect prayers. But Paul says in Ephesians 4, in light of the other two baptisms, there's only one baptism because without that baptism, the other two baptisms will never take in your life the baptism into the death of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the new birth. That's the most important baptism. The other two are important. We don't make light of them. But that first baptism comes as a result of your believing in your heart, Jesus as Lord, and confessing him with your mouth. So he says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. He's not talking about water baptism there. He's talking about we were buried with Christ into his baptism of death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. And I again share with you from Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 that when you and I received Jesus as our Savior, resurrected life, resurrection life now comes and takes up residence in your born again spirit. You have raising from the dead life in your spirit right now. It's in you. It's in you right now. You may never take advantage of it. You may never use it. But nonetheless, it's in you. That as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, live our lives in the newness of life. Paul says to us here, 
that baptism into Christ's death is automatic. The moment you're born again, that baptism is automatic. But he's also teaching us that walking in this newness of life, it is not automatic. It is not. It's dependent on one simple thing. On renewing our minds to the word of God. To finding out what we have, who we are, what we've been given. The majesty of Christ living in us, the hope of glory. Verse 5. He says, but if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So again, he's saying here, your spirit being dead or separated to sin and its nature, it's automatic. But he's saying walking in this resurrected life is dependent on knowing something. And he tells you what that is in the very next verse, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man, that old sin-filled nature man is now crucified with Christ. Here's the key. That the sin, I'm sorry, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Not talking about your physical body. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, so the old man, the moment you're born again, this old man that we were born with because of Adam's sin is now dead. He's now crucified with Christ. And this is where people have been confused. And even preachers sometimes don't preach this correctly. I'm not being correct because I'm me. I'm being correct because this is what the Bible says. When you're born again, your spirit doesn't have two natures. And some preachers say you have two natures in your spirit that you still have the sin nature and Christ nature. No, that'd make you schizophrenic. Again, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So you don't have the sin nature and God's nature within you. You don't have them in you. You don't have two natures. No, your new nature, this new nature in you has no desire, no lust whatsoever to ever again for the rest of your life sin. Disobey God. Do something that's decadent or corrupt or immoral or unethical. Your spirit man never has a desire to do that. This should be a logical question to all of you today. Well, Pastor, if that's so, why do I still have a desire to sin? That should be logical, okay? Why do I still have a desire? You know why? Paul just said, because this old nature left behind a body of sin. This old nature that we are now absolved from, taken out of us, left behind a body of sin. It left behind the effects of the old man through an unrenewed mind. When you and I are born into this world, again, we're born into sin. We have the nature of the enemy. That nature teaches you to be selfish. You come out crying, you selfish little thing, you. Pay attention to me is the first thing that baby's trying to say. Huh? Come on. That nature compels us and teaches us to be immoral, corrupt, decadent, to behave incorrectly. And then you have two things that conspire with it. You have the world system, which is lorded over by the devil, and you have the flesh itself. You have all of this. So we were taught to be sinners. We were taught to be angry. We were taught to not get mad but to get even. Our nature taught us to be jealous and envious and competitive. Our spirit trained us to do that, family. And so our minds were programmed by that old nature. Do y'all get this? Our minds, we couldn't help ourselves. 
We were programmed this way. And listen to me, if you get nothing else from today, our minds will continue to function as they have been programmed until we get them renewed, until we get them renovated. We have to reprogram our minds. I'm telling you, that's the key. I keep telling you all that. This is the key. See, a computer is designed after the human mind. And if you have a computer and you don't like what it's spitting out, I suggest you reprogram the computer. So it will spit out what you want it to spit out. You see, family, you have to reprogram what's in your mind. And then what happens is that you come to a great church like this where the Holy Spirit's giving you the truth. And you go back out around your family and friends and acquaintances and what they start saying when you start sharing some of these truths, be careful who you share truth with. Jesus said, don't give holy, don't give that which is holy to dogs. Be careful. Be careful. Learn to discern. But they will say, well, 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 we're just old sinners saved by grace. No, we were an old sinner. We've been saved by grace. And now greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. We are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so they will tell you, you can't do what the word says. That that church is just trying to cheerlead you. No, we're telling you the truth because I'm giving you the word. But to manifest God's life that is inside of us through the new birth. It is all dependent upon upon our renewing our mind to God's Word. So I'm here to tell you again, family, your mind is the determining factor. Your spirit, listen, your born-again spirit, it's always high. It's always for the things of God. Your spirit, man, will never, ever again give you a thought of decadence or corruption unholiness, unrighteousness. Your spirit is always for the things of God, but your flesh will always be led by the five senses. And our minds get to choose which way we're going. With that said, you are not evil. You are not evil. Because you think that you're evil because these desires to sin keep popping up. No, That old nature left behind a body of sin. You're no longer a sinner. You now have a new spirit. You have to renew your mind. You can think that you are evil because of these lusts and these desires that are coming from the flesh. Let me tell you something. The Bible teaches us very, very clearly we are now free people. We are now liberated from that sin nature. We're liberated and made free from the devil. We're free from all of that. Thank you, everybody, for listening today. Again, that was just a piece of Pastor Don's teaching, Walking by the Spirit, Part 1, from his series, The Real You. You can get the entire series by emailing us at ocfc.org or clicking a link in the show notes. So thank you so much again for being with us today. Remember to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, rate us, interact with us on social media. We're on Facebook. Uh, Leave comments in the comment section. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you got out of this episode and let us know what you want to hear about. Ask us questions. We want to go deeper into the word with you. We want to be a community of people Uh, pursuing Jesus together. So interact with us. Let us know what you think. Thank you again for being here today, and we'll see you back next Friday for a brand new episode. You've been listening to the OCFC podcast. You can find more information about Odessa Christian Faith Center at ocfc.org. Be sure to find us on Facebook and Twitter. Email us your questions or thoughts about this podcast at ocfc at ocfc.org. Thank you for listening and be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your friends.